and welcome to a brand new presentation brought to you by Doha Debates. I'm Nella Hidai, the host of this show, Dear World Live. I am coming to you from my house in London. We are living through an unprecedented era and all of us have been touched in some way by the coronavirus pandemic. Now, I have a lot of show to bring you today. Each week, you can join us every Tuesday. Uh, we will be coming to you at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. British Summer Time, and 5 p.m. PM Arabian Standard Time. We will be coming to you uh, with topics that will be either directly or in some way connected to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, before I get to the show, uh, I want to say that I won't be doing this alone. Each week, I will be joined by two of you, two guests uh, that will be commenting and talking about what topic we cover each week. Uh, and this week, I'm joined by Jawad Galayani, uh, who's studying at Carnegie Mellon University. And with me is Taha Karim, who's at Georgetown. Both of you are in Qatar. Say hello very quickly, guys. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to see you. Now, yeah. I want you to listen in. Uh, we've got two special guests that are going to be joining me today. I want you to think about how you feel and, and we'll be coming to you uh, intermittently to get your comments and your thoughts. Those, so stay tuned. Those of you who are joining us uh, on many different platforms, YouTube, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you are, welcome. It's a joy to have you. As ever, we are always keen to hear from you. What do you think? What are you going through? What do you think about the topic that we are covering in today's show? So in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to our very special guest. But first, to the topic of the show, we will be taking a look and discussing the impact of the coronavirus on the world's largest democracy, the nation of India, particularly how it's affecting both economically and socially the 1.3 billion people that live in that nation. So let me bring you up to speed with what's been going on in India, just in case you don't quite know. So back in January, the first few cases of the coronavirus were detected in the state, uh, in the southern state of Kerala. Now, moving forward to February, there didn't seem to be a drastic uh, speed up of the virus or, or being able to count the virus, detecting it. But suddenly last month, it all changed and that number skyrocketed. On March the 24th, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ordered a national nationwide lockdown. And that meant that the 1.3 billion people that live in India, the world's largest democracy, were told to stay put. It was a nationwide lockdown. This very morning, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced that the lockdown will now be extended through to May 3rd. This is having a huge consequence on the people living in India. Millions of people have suddenly lost their income, their means of living, and there have been chaotic scenes around the country as those Migrant workers who have had to leave the cities and their jobs that no longer exist are being forced to board buses to go back home to their villages. So the images you're seeing now are all in cities and places around India where people are obviously forced into these really, really cramped conditions to try and go back home to their families. Now, the streets of India, I've been to India several times and I've never seen them like this. Empty. Shops are closed. Highways are completely devoid of any cars. 1.3 billion people, as I said, are being forced to stay at home. Now, the number of cases of the coronavirus themselves in India hasn't increased dramatically uh, with respect to the population, the 1.3 billion people that live in India, but there are approximately 10,000 known cases and 300 unfortunate deaths. Now to my very special guests, both of whom are based in India and both of whom are living through this right now. I am joined, very lucky to be joined, by Jiata Ghosh, one of the world's foremost economists. She's based in New Delhi and has been commenting about the situation and what she's, what you, Jayata, are living through and seeing every day um, on Twitter. You've been doing webinars and also writing articles. Thank you so much for joining me. And also Ravi Mishra, my friend, and colleague, and also an international journalist working in the city of Bhopal in central India, 
and uh, you've been organizing food parcel deliveries and getting help to those in most acute of needs. Ravi, Jayata, thank you, so, Jati, thank you so much for joining me. So I just want to go, I want to kick things off straight away. So uh, Jati, what have you made of this lockdown? Has it been conducted successfully? What do you make of the fact that it's now been extended as of this morning? You know, we're in this extraordinary situation where the prevention is almost worse than the cure. This is a humanitarian catastrophe in a country like India because 95% of our workers are informal. They have no formal contracts. They have no protection of any kind, legal or social. And what you did was you gave them four hours notice before telling them that, you know, your livelihoods are at stake. You're, you're losing for the next three weeks and now for the next five weeks. Your livelihoods, you're not going to get wages, probably. Many of the migrant workers whose jobs actually led to where they lived, they lost even the place to live. And all of this was done so abruptly with no planning. Even the state governments didn't know. Other ministers didn't know what was going on. So it was an incredibly badly planned thing, which led to immense human suffering. So we've had, as you saw, the pictures of those migrants. But in fact, now those buses have been stopped. And in fact, migrants who have been trying to get home, walking sometimes hundreds of kilometers, have been beaten on the roads. They have 92 year old women have been attacked as they're trying desperately somehow to get home. Uh, they've been sprayed with very dangerous chemicals. I mean, all kinds of very violent, cruel attacks on migrants who are just somehow trying to ensure their survival. There's a real problem because there is a huge issue of food and I'm sure you will hear more about that because there's actual food scarcity. We are seeing millions of people facing starvation and it's you've lost money many of these people lived hand to mouth you know they paid for the next week or the next day with their earnings of the last week now suddenly there are no earnings you've had three weeks of this very inadequate relief the government's fiscal package is tiny it's pathetic 0.5 percent of gdp only there's not enough in terms of distribution of food we have grain stocks overflowing with the government and somehow these are not being released to feed people so what and, I'm hearing, Jati, is that actually not only is a problem the fact that this virus is a deadly virus, it's going to cause enormous suffering, enormous health implications, but that in terms of the government of India, there just wasn't enough precaution. Why is that? Because India didn't really confront the coronavirus, not economically, not socially, not in a public health way, until very recently. So they had ample time. What do you think is the root cause of the delay in the response and the botched response as you've categorized it? Well, you know, the delay, I cannot understand because they knew. And in fact, opposition leaders had been telling them from early February that you must actually do something. State chief ministers in Kerala had been saying, please, get ready, get prepared. Nothing was done. And then when the cases started to multiply, they suddenly panicked and then they did this lockdown. Now, the lockdown is really pushing the can down the road unless you take measures during the lockdown to prepare yourself. I don't think anything was done. Today, the prime minister spoke to the people. He didn't say, what have we done in the last three weeks? He didn't say right. the measures we've taken for your relief, for your support or for dealing with the virus when the cases explode. So yeah. there's a real problem. Okay, let me bring in Ravi now, because you mentioned, mentioned the huge cost to this, not only in terms of public health, but also socially and economically. Ravi, tell me what you have been doing, because I've been following you over on Instagram. If we can bring up your Instagram page right there, Ravi Mishra. Uh, you're a journalist. You, you're, you're usually used to staying behind the camera, I know, because I've worked with you. But here you are getting ready to go out to distribute food. You've taken out, as from what I can understand, loans uh, yourself to try and cope with the situation and you're putting yourself in harm's way. Anyone who wants to see what's going on in Bhopal, in the front line in central India uh, of the coronavirus, they can absolutely log onto your Instagram and check out the amazing work that you're doing. But enough of a promotion about you. Tell me what you're doing. What are you seeing? What is going on? Ravi, can you hear me? Oh, I, d I don't think I can hear you. One second. I think this might be a mic issue. Bear with me. Can you hear me? Ravi, have you turned your mic off? Hmm, I can't hear you very well, Ravi. Whilst we figure out what's going on with your mic, let me go back to my two 
uh, students who are standing by. Maybe we can hear from them very quickly. So, um, Ravi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. can you hear Brilliant. Me? Tell us. We're all on the screen at the same time. Let us all know what it is you're going through. Well, there's a lot uh, uh, that is going through, but I'll talk about the most recent case that basically, you know, pushed me last night that I can't stop and I had to take a loan because uh, you brought up the loan. Uh, last night I received a call from a laborer, her name is Mamta, and uh, I have been receiving a lot of calls every day. Uh, but usually people have been asking me for flour, for rice, for lentils. But this lady, she first thing she said, don't get me anything if you can't. That's how she started. And I was like, okay, yeah, hi, tell me what's going on. And she's like, I have been feeding my little guy who is around two years old. And I have been feeding him water mixed with sugar. And now I'm out, out of sugar in the house. So don't get me flour, don't get me anything, but just get me sugar. And that's when I realized that, all right, I have to keep on going. I mean, until two days ago, I mean, now I even have stopped counting the families because it's 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 a huge task. Until two days ago, it was approx 2,500 people, uh, and the situation is bad. It's 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 really bad because we all know that uh, the lockdown started on this certain date, but we don't understand that these people, for them, the lockdown started two weeks earlier because these people, they stop getting work from a week before only. They go back to their home, whatever money they have, uh, think, they basically- Do you think that people understand what is going on? It, it seems like information seems to be at a real deficit, almost as much as food is. A lot of these, the people that you're encountering, do, do they ask you what it is that's happened to their lives? I actually ask them if they understand what's going on, you know, because, uh, and they have no idea. They just basically say that, uh, yes, there is some sort of something going on. That's the answer. There's some sort of something going on. And they have no idea how to protect themselves. So, Why are you, as just a regular Indian citizen, being forced to put your own health, your own life on the line? What are you seeing when you go out and distribute these food to the needy? Are there government agencies? Is there a coordinated thing going on? And uh, at, at the back of your comment, I mean, we're seeing images now of, of rice and grain that's been handed out, but is there enough being done and who's doing the work? And in a moment, I'd like to bring in Taha and Jowd into this as well. So let, let me know, Ravi. Uh, well, see, where I am in Bhopal, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about an incident from two days ago. Uh, if you go through my Instagram gallery, you would be able to, three days ago, you would be able to see the video as well. I got a call from a friend of mine who told me that there is a group of women who are who have gathered outside a police station. I was like, okay, and it's like, and I think they're protesting there for food. Okay. You didn't mention how many women. So I was like, all right, I've got a few packets. I'll go and uh, I'll hand them out. The moment I arrived there, there were more than 30 women there. Right. And this is just 30. a small town, a small village? This is a very small town. It's, it's, I mean, it's not a village, but it's a very small town. And the location that I'm talking about, it's the, it's the newest part of Bhopal. And are you seeing the, a government response as well? I mean, uh, there seems to be a lot of talk where I live in the, in, in the global north of tests. We're obsessed with tests. But in India, the acute need is simply food. Is that being delivered? So this is where I was coming to. When I went there, these women, these women, they told me that they have been kicked out of the police station without any hopes for any food. And the moment I rolled my window down, they were aggressive, they were furious. Because they had been kicked out with zero hopes of any food. My goodness, I think we're seeing some of the images right now um, of you distributing food. And I can't imagine what it must be like for you when you have to say no. How close people were, they wanted to get inside my car because I had like, they could see three or four packets of food. You know, how do you decide who gets the food? Because I'm just one man. I mean, I have had, a, I have had some really good friends who have been helping me behind the scenes. 
but there are so many people and these are not the only 30 women these 30 women were the one who could walk to the police station okay ravi thank you stand by i'd like to bring juden uh taha into this you guys live in qatar qatar is a fairly organized small nation that is able to perhaps uh it's, it's an advanced nation it's able to perhaps better take care of its citizenship what are you seeing and what are you experiencing and what do you feel when you hear uh ravi uh, and jiati talk about what they're seeing in india what are your reactions jude you first so um all of the stories that ravi told us were extremely emotional and i think even somewhere here where we're all extremely privileged to be able to stay home um it comes from a great like a place of great ignorance and privilege to tell people to stay home without actually providing them the means to do so so i think the government in india shouldn't be putting um people in a situation like ravi is where he has to go out of his way to be able to help people when it's not really his job. Taha, what about you? Are you having to check your first world privilege much the same way as I am? I'm humbled to hear about the efforts Ravi uh, and GRT are making to try and get the world out there. How do you feel when you hear that compared to what you're going through? We're all going through this. Uh, I think my situation is a little different from how Joe described it. Yes, I feel privileged. Yes, it's ignorant for leaders to say, just stay inside and everything will be fine. But my family lives in Kashmir, all my family, and they have been under lockdown from the past seven months. And like it was just been like 10 or 12 days since they started like going out and going back to the offices and a little bit of normalcy was restored and then just COVID hit and like, just like what Indian state did in August, they did the same thing this time as well and just put everybody under lockdown. Now there's no provision for getting medicine. Now there's no provision for getting good food and people are struggling just like we saw in the pictures in Bhopal. And India, mind you, is hosting the second largest population in the world. And with no mechanism in place by the Indian state, everybody is suffering, be it the middle class or be it the poor. Now, I just want to take a little moment to thank you all, uh, those of you watching. We are getting more and more of you viewing in on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, wherever you're joining us for this conversation on the first of the Dear World live shows. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jayati, I want to come to you next. Uh, and I want to just share a comment that we got from YouTube from Christopher. And Christopher wants to ask, India was given four hours advance notice to a 21 day lockdown. You can't quite believe it. Is it true? How can it be so? And how do we organize ourselves? How do we respond to such poor political governance? Yes, it is unfortunately true. It's unbelievable. I agree with you. And no democratic government should be able to do this. But this is what has happened. At eight o'clock at night, we get the address of the prime minister who announces that it's all going to be, you know, uh, closed for 21 days and you have to do this as a sacrifice because we have to contain the virus now they know that so many people are informal workers they but you know i just want to add to the even if you had done this terribly planned you know very poor short notice kind of lockdown you could still try and provide relief ameliorate the suffering we have got uh, public food stocks of 77 million tons that is five times what we need we could have immediately distributed this to all the state governments free because this is all surplus. At least 50 million tons of surplus distributed immediately. Let the state governments actually Why? distribute Why is this happening? Why is this happening? We don't know. We are still don't know. We are shouting from the rooftops, distribute the food. In fact, it's rotting in some of these storage places in these go towns. We are shouting, saying, distribute this food, give it free. We don't know why it's not happening. Jayati, I'd like to maybe ask you to address Ravi, because this isn't just a one-way conversation. Uh, Ravi, Jayati, you two are living this uh, in New Delhi and Bhopal in India. You've seen different sides of the same problem. What, because we are Doha Debates, because we are Dear World Live, we want to talk about solutions and what we can do as individuals. And Jude and Taha and me, we can only look and support you. Tell us, have a conversation with yourselves. Tell me between you what you think the rest of the global community can do and what you guys can do each other. Ravi, let me come to you first. See, first of all, we need to understand uh, that uh, the problem, what's 
what's happening right now is when you think about the migrant labor people's attention go towards uh, metro cities delhi mumbai kolkata bangalore but that's not the case because there is a massive number of uh, uh, because india is changing there's a lot of real estate uh, business that's booming everywhere across the country you know so, so in small big towns and there are certain locations where i have been where there has been no government official where there has been no ngos that have even visited those people because they are far too interiors so they need to put people on the ground this is yeah. very important they need to put people on the ground is what i'm hearing from you ravi so excuse me i'm trying to deal with a lot of different delays at the same time thank you guys those of you who are watching us right now jutaha i want you to start maybe thinking about a question or a comment that you might have to our special guests over in india but before that i've got a question that's coming here um that that perhaps we can look uh, to addressing if we look at the the public health side of this if we try to understand the coronavirus and and the the mortality and the the negative health outcomes that'll come out of this what can we expect um nog 33 asks is the hospitals in india any good tell us a real number i i assume he means like uh, uh, the latest death tolls or infection uh, numbers jati let me come to you first are the hospitals in india capable of dealing with this there's a lot of variation across states the state of kerala where it all began it actually has a decent system a uh, health infrastructure and they have managed to contain it and despite the fact that they began with it and they've had a number of cases they've had only two deaths totally in india we've had about 330 deaths from corona virus but we have had 200 deaths almost from the lockdown lockdown related deaths of different kinds uh, the rest of the country the infrastructure varies greatly in the most of the north and central india it's terrible including where ravi is and it's not really adequate the one of the purposes of the lockdown was not just to buy time but to actually enable the governments to increase that infrastructure to improve the facilities to get proper protective equipment for health workers to get testing kits to get all of that none of that seems to have happened state governments haven't been given resources they they're completely cash strapped at the moment the central government owes them a huge amount of money and Let hasn't me this yes reality it, it, it's, it's just leading me to think of a, of of, a, of where we're going to get to next obviously we need to be better prepared as individuals we need to do our bit we need to stay at home as we're being advised to do um but nationally is globally i mean there's a huge divide between the north wealth wealthy nations people who have infrastructure and healthcare systems and the global south who don't is this going to exacerbate those fault lines between rich and poor the global north and the global south i mean you mentioned kerala state but there's a global issue here and as an economist i'm sure you're interested in that absolutely and in fact it's already exacerbated the inequalities it's the developing world has been so much more badly hit even before the virus has hit us most developing countries others in china haven't really had a big increase in the pandemic yet but we have hit by capital flows reversal by the collapse of global trade by our sovereign debt values massively going for a toss by our currencies depreciating so we are facing global headwinds from every direction and then all of us have instituted lockdowns so our economies have collapsed we are in a much much worse situation economically than any country in the north and it's going to be much harder to come out of this because really the, the the global system has really so far no evidence that it is recognizing this and taking the right kinds of measures we just had a comment there about private companies if if we can get that back up i'd love to go to ravi uh, about that and then i'm going to come to jude and tahar to see if they've got anything to say or add to the conversation that question there um don't you think it will be better ravi if we allow private companies to help directly rather than governments that would be more effective uh, i think that's pranjal who's asking that um what do you think of that that's a very good question and that would definitely help a lot because i'm sorry to say this but there's a lot of corruption and things move very slow everything that is related to government has to go through a lot of uh, different steps and there is corruption in almost every 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 part of the government you know and i'm not just blaming this on the current government that's just how the government has worked so if you give it to private companies definitely things will get much better and private companies are better they have 
they have far better reach. Okay, so you are for, uh, I mean, you yourself are doing this for no money, no kudos, nothing. It's only because I stumbled across your Instagram that I found your amazing work um, as I was getting. So let's let's get to our student uh, commentators and question askers at this point. Jude uh, and Taha, let me come to you, Taha, first. What are you feeling about everything that you're hearing um, at the moment? And do you have a question for our guests? Uh, I think um, this pandemic knows no boundaries, knows no structures, and it's, it transcends time, it transcends space, and it affects everyone. I think if you look at Global North and the disparity between Global South, I think it has been more devastating in Global North. The only concern I have when I think of India and when I think of, you know, like what's happening in India is, will India bounce back? And as Ravi was saying, how corrupt Indian government is, not the, this not this one, the governments that have come before, and seeing how... <clears throat> China or South Korea dealt with uh, this global pandemic and still are bouncing back. I'm just worried whether India will be able to generate such response. They are not like they are not able to distribute food. How will they start testing and how will they make people aware? And seeing how the prime minister has been dealing with it, it's pretty ignorant and it's pretty uh, it's pretty sad that he's not able to deal with a uh, pandemic just like any other leader is doing right now. So let me come to you, Jude. Do you have a comment or question or anything to build on top of what Taha is saying? Um, I think that going for a lockdown without ensuring that you have the resources or preparation to do it is essentially taking the easy way out because um, you can just put it in the hands of the people and tell them to deal with it because um, it's better for the spread of corona. But it's really not like we saw in the pictures when people were trying to get home in those four hours, maybe that increased the spread of Corona so much for all we know. And so I think there needs to be so much more put in place before taking a very drastic step. Now we're coming to near the end of the show. And before that, of course, within the DNA of the Doha debates and Dear World Live is to try and think about solutions, is to try and think about what we can do. There is no one size fits all solution to the coronavirus pandemic globally, as we have been discussing in India, uh, in Qatar, in the UK where I am. Things have been going in different directions. There are different paths that we all need to take. So I want to come to each of my guests and I thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, and I want to hear from you. What are you personally doing and what are you hoping are the next steps that could be taken in terms of dealing with this? Uh, Jude, you're there next to me, I think to this side, there you are. Uh, why don't you go first? What are you doing personally and what do you hope to see? So because I have enough privilege to be able to um, social distance and stay at home, that is, of course, what I'm doing, first and foremost. Um, and I hope that in the near future, everyone is given the resources to be able to do that, supported by governments and private companies. Brilliant. Taha, what about you? What are you doing? Are you washing your hands? That seems to be a tip we're getting from a lot of people. Yeah, I think that was the first step that uh, was recommended by the WHO and everyone here. And building upon what Jude was saying, yes, like I'm in a position of privilege and a position of power and I'm social distancing, staying in, not going out. But uh, personally, what I feel is that uh, governments globally should do is just decentralize resources so that they trickle down to everyone that's that's in need. Uh, more than people, you know, more than people who can access those resources and you need to think about people who can't. And uh, I just want to highlight a very interesting comment coming from Sweden. It says, uh, public health authorities here have told citizens to use common sense. Not much of a strategy there, Sweden. Doesn't feel too much like a strategy. Ravi, what are you doing? Apart from using your common sense, what are you doing personally? And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about how uh, you're gathering money and, and getting funds for the work that you're doing out there. So I have a GoFund page that I have set up with a friend of mine, uh, Ashley. Uh, that's how I'm getting the help, but still I'm $5,000 out of my pocket. <laughs> and that's beyond what I can afford. But at the same time, you know, when you get a calls like this mother, like last night, and I have seven missed calls since this uh, episode started. So I am not going to stop. I can't say no to people who reach out to me. It's just not possible. I have taken a small loan from 
a few of my friends. If I run out of cash, Nell, I'm calling you. So be prepared. <laughs> I've got my phone on loud right here waiting for you. Jayati, what about you? Obviously, you're writing, you're getting the messages out there, you're, you're, you're doing your work as an economist, but what are you doing personally and what are your hopes uh, about, about India itself? Well, I, of course, all of us who can are donating as much as we can to people like Ravi who are helping and who are all the NGOs that are out there on the front lines trying to deliver. But this is not something that should be done by individuals or even by companies. These are public health issues and public concerns. Nutrition is the responsibility of the state. And so we need to get enough voice to make it sure that the central government provides resources to state governments. It's a, it has to be decentralized. I completely agree with Daha about that. It has to be decentralized and it has to be accountable. We have to know what steps they're taking. We have to know how they're doing it. We have to see how the money is being spent. And we have to demand that both food and money goes to the money for those who have lost occupation and livelihood and wages food for everybody, they are actually facing, millions facing starvation, these must be delivered immediately. And it can't only be done by Samaritans like Ravi, it has to be done by the state putting itself out there because it is the responsibility of the state. Jude, Taha, Ravi, Jayasi, I am so grateful to you and your time. You have helped me learn so much and also inspired and informed me. I am thankful to you all. Uh, it is time to say goodbye to you guys before I sign the show off. So I'm going to say bye to all of you. I'm going to wave and we're going to all look like happy family on the screen. Thank you all. Um, for those of you who are watching us, thank you for joining us for the very first uh, Dear World Live show. I'm grateful to you, to your insightful comments coming in from Sweden, from India, from Nigeria, and, and God knows where else. You're all welcome to the show. As I said, every Tuesday we will be coming to you live from my tiny flat in East London. There's just enough time to tell you that next Tuesday we are going to be tackling the issue of how the coronavirus is impacting refugee communities around the world. And I'll be joined by my guests and two of you uh, on the next show. We are Doha Debates. We have a lot of different offerings. Not only can you go on onto YouTube and watch our previous debates that have been going out live, but I also have a podcast called Course Correction that you can get from almost any of the podcast providers. Make sure that you listen to the latest episode, which will drop tomorrow, Wednesday, and you can binge watch, binge listen, I should say, uh, all the previous episodes that are on there right now. As I said, we are in this together, but separately. Join me next week when we'll be coming to you live. See you then. <laughs>